Hey, welcome back to the studio. This is my day of play, where you're taken into the real events and actions of how it happens long before the process of editing or cleaning up. This is really how it went. Reinventing the wheel is an everyday thing, right? Well, so is reinventing your recording studio because Mother Nature has taken a swing at you. We start things off very, very raw in technology. Our conversation with Scott Patterson from Sullivan's Crossing. Conversation number two goes a little deep today into the experiences of being a young adult author in this very complicated world. It's author Robin Benway. This is my day of play, completely unedited in the way of meeting the wizard behind the curtain. Oh, we kick things off with the real one today. We've been hammered by a hurricane slash tropical storm losing electricity as well as the Internet. And so we're fighting like hell just to do whatever we can just to get these things posted, especially when it comes to using a Zoom and you're talking with actors and with different musicians and things. And things don't always go correctly, as you will experience here. This is exactly how it went. But of course, when it really does go up onto the other platforms, it will be you, you'll never know it. You'll never know it. And that's what's fun about my day of play is that you get to experience it right there with me. Excellent. Good morning, Scott. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks. Abs- absolutely fantastic. We're still picking up the pieces here in Carolina. And, you know, uh, when, when the Internet yeah, goes I out, we start relying. No. Yeah. Are you guys affected in, uh, where are you, Charlotte? Are, are we still breaking yeah. up? Yeah, How are, yeah, can, you can you hear me now? Breaking up there, Errol. Uh... Yeah, it's, it's got it. It's. Uh, it's, do you have another phone line you want me to call? Is there another line? Or You, you, you know what? Since you're going to send it to me, what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to go outside. Okay. Okay. So okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Go outside. <laughs> Sorry about this, Scott. You know, technology. No, no I know. They're going through. Yeah, the hurricane. Yeah, all that baloney they went through. Yeah. That was so terrible. Yep. My God. I know. My God. Let's see. Once again, I apologize, you guys. No problem. We're uh, We're good. Okay, <laughs> we're just picking up the pieces here in Carolina. Okay, so if you're ready, go ahead. God, i got to tell you something about Sullivan's Crossing. You know, we, we always compliment the writers and the directors, but you know what? On this show, I have to give a lot of kudos to the actors. The actors bring so much authenticity to those lines, to those scenes, everything. You know, it's, uh, it's quite challenging, and I, I agree. I, I think the cast is contributing mightily to this with these portrayals. Uh, you know, they're forcing us to dig really deep, and uh, that's one of the reasons, uh, the main reason, actually, I, I took this on is because it scared the, the heck out of me. Um, and I questioned whether I was going to be able to pull it off, and I, you know, I still do that every day, and that's kind of how you should go to work Uh and what I do is is being a little bit out of your depth. And that's that's the challenge that you want to face. The thing that scares you is the thing that you should embrace. Um, and we're we're embracing it every day, man. It's it's a real tightrope walk for us. Um, but, uh, yeah, you're seeing the results. So, so thank you for for noticing, you know. One, one of the things my wife and I always talk about when we watch the show and, or experience the show is that I always say he knows that, I'm, that, that we're watching. Every one of those actors know that there are viewers on the other side of the screen, and what they're doing is they're, they're becoming a part of our lives. Right. Well, the thing that I always felt about this part in particular was that if I decided to take this on, it's a great responsibility. It's a huge responsibility to portray it accurately and as with much depth as you can possibly go down and and drag out of yourself right so this would be the character to i don't know end my career on on a high note <laughs> but um but to really you know uh uh you know get everything you can out of yourself in order to to be able to do these scenes because as you know they're they're heavy man they're we're going and getting the the real stuff um and i think that's why people are gravitating to it too much like you and your wife is that is that they know they're not going to get shortchanged on the acting side they're going to get the genuine real emotions that are coming through the screen um because we're living these characters and they're really affecting us and being on set when this is happening um it's quite something the atmosphere changes you know you know when really deep work is happening because everybody gets very very quiet 
and uh, allows you the space to do it. There's something remarkable about a community of people coming together to film this, the crew I'm talking about, this fantastic crew, and they're so respectful of what we're trying to do. Uh, so they're getting out of our ways and they're giving us the space to do it. And uh, I think we we so appreciate that about this particular crew. I'm not saying that that's not normal. It is. But uh, it, it's it's one of the few times that I've been on a set where so many people have to dig so deep every single yep. day. Um, exhausting. Yes. But worth it. Absolutely. I was going to ask you about that, how you deal with going into such an emotional role, because I'm a defragger. I get into something emotional, if we, be it a radio commercial, be it something just very emotional. I've got to go defrag it and break it down so I can get back to a normal person. Well, OK, so everything that is happening in this show to my character, I've been through it before uh, many times. Wow. Um and I'm just bringing uh, my life experience to the role. So it's there. So I trust that. And I've been doing this long enough where I just sort of let it happen. Um, and that was the challenge. I thought, am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to easily let this happen? Or is it going to be, you know, if I'm, I'm just going to have to beat myself up and uh, to try to get this stuff out of uh, out of me in a performance? But it's showing up, you know, and I'm, I'm allowing it to show up. And it's a nice place to be in my life and in my career um, where I'm allowing this stuff to come up and, and, and sharing it with, you know, the camera, with the intimacy of a camera, which is a truth machine, which doesn't let you lie, which is an added layer of pressure <laughs> not to suck. <laughs> you know what I mean? um, um, to be honest about it. And, and uh, it, it's just a wonderful supportive environment uh, to be in, in order to do this level of work. Um and it's an extraordinary experience. It really, really is. Like I said, it's tiring. It, it really is. At the end of the day, you know you've been through it because uh, you just sort of pour into your car and they drive you home and then they pour you out of the car into your condo. And you're like, <laughs> eight hours later, you're back in the car <laughs> again, going to, to bear your soul again. But that's our job. That's what we do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's so far so good. So when you when you pour so much of yourself into it, uh, it I got to ask this question. Do you ever uh, stop in the middle of a role and say, no, 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 I wouldn't act that way in real life. Can we tweak this line here just a little bit so I can put some authenticity into it? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And that's the beauty of uh, uh, what Roma does. She's available for that. She's open to that. And. Uh, that's what makes it uh, just extra special is if there is a tweak that needs to happen and it's, you know, it's, it could be specific to me and, and what I need and how I can portray this moment. And I can usually do it. I can act it better than I can say it. Right. So that's, that's a recurring theme. So I, I behavior is really the focal point in what I do. Uh, I'm more interested in behaving in a way as opposed to saying things. Um, you know, only as a last resort do you ever say anything. Uh, but behavior is a different story, and that's kind of what I like to do. And she's open to that, so I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful relationship that we all have with with Roma. Um, she's she's a great enough talent to realize that she can't provide it all all the time. That other people have ideas and suggestions and she's open to it. So that's very rare, by the way. And uh, we're all very lucky. I, I was going to say, I mean, that sounds like the dream job that everybody, all actors or even people in radio and television would love to have that job where you can work that close with somebody and, and, and have unbelievable results in the end. Um, yeah, you feel like you really have skin in the game, that you're a part of building this whole thing and that your ideas are being taken seriously. And it's just, you know, it really just comes down to um, because they're asking you to dig so deep and get at these real truths of these, you know, these themes, um, you know, they're respecting you and they're and they're saying, you know what, if you're going to do this and you've given me so much so far, yes. Let's let's see how it works out uh, uh, if we cut this line or we change this line or something like that. Um, and I think I, th I think I think a lot of actors don't get enough credit for being good writers, too. OK. Um, 
And I think you have to be, to be, to be really at the top of your game. You really have to know writing. Um, um, so uh, they're very, they're very open to it over there. And I think we're all very lucky as a result. And I think it reflects in the quality of the show. Um, I think it really helps the show. So, um, yeah, it is, it actually is a dream job and a dream location for sure. Would you say that Sullivan's Crossing is our escape? In other words, it's one of those words like with all the yuck that's in the world right now, we go to your storylines and we go, you know, it's pretty bad here, but it's not as bad as what they're doing. And thank God they're going through it so I can live by <laughs> stay through them. <laughs> you think you got it rough. Just check out Sully when he's going through it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the responsibility I feel. I feel this huge responsibility you know, to portray this character as honestly and as deeply as I can. And if I, and if I can do that, I feel like I've put in a good day's work. That's my job. Um, so it is, it's a big responsibility to the audience um, to be as real and honest uh, in this portrayal as I possibly can be uh, on any given day. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, also, if you really think about it, it's a real honor to be given the responsibility to do something like this. Um, uh, acting is a very noble uh, profession. Um, uh, and I know a lot of people won't agree with that, but it, it, you know, we do have a responsibility to portray humanity in not such a good light sometimes. And then, you know, the better angel, angels of our nature to bring those out as well. And I think this show has both of that. And it's, at the end of the day, it's po it's a positive experience because we're all going, you know, we're all facing our demons uh, in real and powerful ways. But we're coming, we're trying to come out on top. We're trying to do the right thing by the community, by the family, by our to ourselves. Um, so there's a real, uh, what I would say, positive tension uh, for an audience to experience. Like, is he going to do it? Is she going to do it? Yay, let's root for them. So there's a lot to root for here because they recognize it in themselves. And if we can give anybody any kind of strength, uh, to, you know, to sort of examine their own lives and their own addictions or what have you, their own issues, then, you know, we feel very good about that. Um, so it's it's just, again, uh, and I don't mean to repeat myself, but it's it's a huge responsibility and we all take it very seriously. I'm blessed with the opportunity to share some conversations with these authors that write these unbelievable novels, and they dream of having a show like Sullivan's Crossing. This one came from a book. Have you sat with the author? I mean, have, have you have you have you read the book? What what is, what's gone you know gone on with that part of the story? Uh, no, and no, um, I don't want to be exposed or corrupted by what has been already written. I want it to create, I want to create something as if it's the first time it's as, as if we're doing it, uh, because I don't want to judge the character or judge the work having already read. Now there's, there are a lot of actors who, if they're taking over a role on Broadway, they'll go to several productions and they'll see like Eric Roberts, I think went, yes. uh, he either refused to go see John Malkovich burn this on Broadway in the late eighties, or he went to several productions to, to get a, a taste of it. You know, pe some people are different, right? They either want to see the, read the book or they, or they don't something like this um, that I was told from the beginning, isn't an exact portrayal of the book. Uh, I wanted to stay, stay away from, and I'm going to stay away from it. Um, I think after the fact, you know, maybe 10, 10 years down the road, uh, maybe I'll pick up a book and I'll say, I'll say, oh, that's interesting. Well, we did this. We didn't do that. You know, that kind of a thing. Just as an exercise. But <laughs> for now, I just I, I don't want to be exposed to it. I just rather feel like I'm creating something original in the moment um, and that our team is doing that. Um, it's really none of my business what's what's happened in the books at all. So <laughs> I, I love that because that reminds that me so way. much of the music in the 50s and 60s. When they would go into the studio, they only had uh, you know, only so much time to get it done. Get it done, make right. it original, release it, get it, get it out there. And I, I love that about your acting skills is that, hey, let's, let's do this. Let's be original. Let's get it out there and let them determine what, what's going to happen. Yeah, the minute you expose yourself to something that has been written or it's a book, um, it, it, it comes you know, that you're going to do the research and you're going to try to nail the psychology somewhat but uh in something like this um you know i just wanted to stay far away from it 
Not that I'm I'm saying that they're not great books. I think everybody should go read them and then watch the show. Sure. Uh, And then they can compare notes. That's kind of fun. But I just, as, as an artist, I didn't want to expose myself to it. Wow. But I I totally understand that because that's how I felt about Rocky. I read the book Rocky first and then I went and saw the movie and went, eh. And everybody's going, no, it's great. Eh, eh, I'm not feeling it. I I don't know what you guys saw. Oh, man. (laughs) So how important is that scene? Because what happens is, is that we get to see the full production on CW. But when you guys walk onto that set, you you get what, you know, that's Hollywood magic right there. But how do, how do you put yourself in that moment knowing that what we see is not what you're experiencing? Well, because I've just been there before, you know. Uh, anything that I've done on this show, I've I've experienced it many times. I've been there before. I've, 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 I've had all these challenges in my life. Um, so, you know, I just trust it and it comes up and... I try not to push it too hard and, uh, you know, it all kind of seems to happen. Um, and I think that says more about where I am in my life and as an actor, um, uh, and, you know, just sort of trusting the instrument to be able to play those notes. Um, and so I'm in a very comfortable place right now and, uh, I'm really enjoying the work, uh, still fraught with, uh, uh, peril, and uh, every day when I go to set, because, you know, there's always this voice in the back of your head that's like, man, are you really going to be able to do this? <laughs> so, uh, but then you just sort of relax into it and sort of trust the work and trust yourself. And, and uh, you know, it comes up, just comes up. Well, that's certainly should bring it up because I just attended a lecture where the, where the guy comes out with a mirror and he says, I introduce you to the greatest person you will ever meet. And it, and it, and it was pointed at us. And he goes, that person right there, it listens to everything you say to yourself. Every little inspiration or thing, it's going to rip you apart. So it's like, but it's, right. you're right. When you've got those voices in your head, you, you've got to take them on. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I've had a lifetime to do it, so I know how to do it. So. <laughs> 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 I, I just love the idea that, that CW has their own app because I'll tell you what, what I love about going and watching Sullivan's Crossing is that I can rewind. I can relive a scene. I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. What did they just say? Mm-hmm. Let me experience that again. So I, I love the app version of Sullivan's Crossing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's available to everyone and uh, they should use it. Yeah. Uh, just for that reason. It's a perfect example why they should, they should download the app. Uh, Again, wonderful show. We're happy as all get out to be on it. Um, we love the work we're doing. We love being in Nova Scotia. Um, just a wonderful experience all the way around. Um, and, uh, you know, tune in to season two, man. It's uh, Sully is left on the canvas with a stroke, perhaps, uh, at the end of season one with a cliffhanger. And, you know, you'll want to tune in to see if he gets up and keeps swinging, you know. Yeah, see, it's, it's those cliffhangers to me that when, when season one ended, it's like, come on, come on. And how long do we have to wait? And so, I mean, that's what I love about the writing. That goes all the way back to our first first part of this conversation about the writing. It, the, the, okay. the writing and the acting is so perfect on it because it gets us emotionally. You know, there's so many ways you can go with this writing because the writing is bare bones and it's open-ended. And, you know, it could really stink if if you don't nail the writing, there's so you could go completely the opposite direction. Um, but you know we have such wonderful directors and support and all that. And uh, there's a lot of conversations going around about choices that you make, um, and usually they're with yourself. Uh, but uh, we have wonderful directors that we can bounce things off and. And they're all just so great and they just have such great taste and, and, and they're wonderful at what they do. And they, they, you know, they, if you're doubting yourself at all about a certain choice or a certain line or a turn of phrase, then they'll, they'll help you out. So it's, it's a wonderful support team. Love working there. Scott, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. No, oh, thank you so much. I'd love to come back. Excellent. Will you be brilliant today? Okay. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Arrow. Bye, buddy. Hey, coming up next, we're going to be talking with Robin Binway. She's a YA author, young adults, especially those in middle school. Ooh, how tough can that be? Hello and good morning, everybody. Hi, good morning. This is the operator. I'm calling with Robin Benway, the author of Girls with Skylark Lane, for your interview. Excellent, excellent. 
And Mr. Collins, uh, do you know the air date? I know that storm kind of messed you guys up, oh, but I didn't know if and, you knew on this one. Yeah, and we're still messed up down here. Um, the, I'm sorry. Uh, the, but the I good really news is, everyone. we good news we have a connection here because my last interview, we I had to go outside and do the interview. <laughs> So. Oh jeez! Well, yeah, I'm glad we're inside and we're safe. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 it should. It, wait, 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 wait! I, I did put it up there. I have it scheduled for this coming Wednesday. Beautiful. I will go and let the producer know, and I'll get you connected. Excellent. Thank you so much. Good with Mr. Collins. Please go ahead. Hello and good morning, Robin. How are you doing today? Good morning. So nice to speak with you. I'm great. Thank you. Man, you got to tell me what your secret sauce is in the way of being able to write a book that is meant for YA readers. But as an adult, I'm going, oh, my God, give me some more of this. (laughs) Well, first of all, caffeine has never hurt. So that's always a good plus for sure. (laughs) I think, you know, a lot of I've answered that question off and on throughout my career. How can you be an adult but understand kids or write about kids? in a way that resonates with them, which is a huge compliment to ask that question, of course, to me. But I think it's also, regardless of our age, who are we? How do we relate to the world a little bit older and a little bit wiser? But I don't think the the questions change very much. I think it's just who are we in that moment and what sort of tools do we have at our disposal to answer them? I put a lot of research into this thing called tweendom. And and the thing that I that, that keeps <laughs> coming up is the fact that it's like, it's not, not that we're spying on what it's like to be a teen today. It's just that our internal bodies on the inside still believe we're a certain age. I I still say I'm 17. When people say, how old are you? I'm 17 inside my mind, body, and soul. So I think that's one of the reasons why I love these books so much. Oh, I, you know, it's funny. I will say to somebody, we'll talk about middle school or junior high, whatever, whatever you call it in your community. And it just immediately, everybody goes, oh gosh, middle school. You know, it brings up this anxiety and terror of the being that age. So I think it's in some ways like a bonding experience. And, you know, I hope kids go through life without feeling anxious or nervous about those things. But those are also very valid emotions about, you know, new experiences as well. I'm a mobile DJ. We just did a middle school dance. Oh, let me tell you about that energy that was in that gymnasium. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I have cold sweat just thinking about this. <laughs> but you know what's fun about doing that is that when, when I do get the opportunity to, to sit with them before as they're setting up the gym or at the end when they're cleaning things up, I'll bring up like authors like yourself. And it's so fast. They look at me going, how do you know about Robin? What, what are you talking about? Yeah. And, and and they really do. They To me, that's part of the connection thing between adults and, and, and tweens. Yeah. It's funny, I think social media, even though hopefully younger kids are not on social media yet, they're aware of it. And I think the internet exists as well. Kids are aware of things in a way that like maybe you and I weren't aware of growing up. Our world was a lot smaller. Now it's global within 15 seconds. And so I think we all do share a lot of knowledge. Like I have had very in-depth conversations about eye cream with my friend's 10-year-old daughter. And I have had Taylor Swift conversations with my friend's (laughs) nine-year-old daughter. Like very serious conversations about those things. The conversations you're having with these soon-to-be teens or tweens, do you, do you feel that that's what shows up inside your books? Because, I mean, you've got some lessons in here about forgiveness that you, if I walked up to somebody and talked about forgiveness, they'd go, ah, get out of here. But yet they find it in a book and they're going to be listening to it. You don't have to be putting yourself out there per se, right? You can just read about it. And I also think, and I remember this so vividly as a teenager, and I see it a lot now when I write for older kids, older teenagers, the way you talk to your friends is very different than the way you talk to your parents, to your mom, to your dad, to your yep. family. And it's very different than how you feel on the inside and the way your brain talks to yourself. And I think it's always really important to keep that in mind, that what a kid says is sometimes very, very different than what they actually actually feel. And my job when I'm writing is to remember that, to keep in mind the point of view of my character. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot of these days is I'm seeing a lot of twins as well as triplets. I mean, I I would love to see the numbers of of people that are going to read your books and, and and get back in touch with you. (laughs) <laughs> there are definitely more twins. There's definitely a lot of twins in my family as well where the idea came from. And one of the reasons I wanted the main characters to be twins, and they're both the dual narrators of the book. They go back and forth chapter to chapter. But I wanted to see what it looks like when you grow up your whole life looking like somebody else, yes. sharing the same thing, acting, you know, not the same way, but living the same life. And then once you hit that age where you start to differ and you start to have different interests, 
you know, Jack starts to have a crush on a neighborhood boy and Aggie doesn't feel that way yet. And who gets their period first? Yeah. You know, all of those different things for their birthday. Um, their dads take them to a restaurant and they take them to a store and that's like their big birthday celebration. And this is the first time where Aggie wants to go to Cheesecake Factory and Build-A-Bear and Jack wants to go to Sushi and um, Sephora. And, and both of those are valid. Both of those are totally fine. But it's, okay, how do you maintain that friendship and that relationship with your twin when you're changing so quickly? And there's really not an answer to that. It's something that they'll probably navigate for the rest of their lives. You just opened up a huge door, not necessarily with twins, but I looked exactly like my brother and I chose different things to, so I wouldn't be compared to my brother and became a radio mm-hmm. person because my brother wanted nothing to do with something like that. I wonder how many adults <laughs> will pick up this book and go, I, I looked exactly like my sibling and I too yeah. went a completely different direction. Yeah, it's it's wild how things like that that are so formative in your childhood can shape you as an adult, which was what makes writing books like this so much fun. <laughs> Speaking of your writing, what is your discipline each day? I mean, the first thing I have to do every single morning is I've got, I've got to write. That is, that is my discipline. What is your discipline? That is absolutely not my discipline in any way. <laughs> I wish it was, to be honest. That would probably be more productive. Um, I am definitely the kind of person who takes a lot of time to wool gather. I think a lot about the book yeah. when, I'm, when I'm driving, going for walks with the dog, when I'm doing the dishes. I picture it over and over and over yep. in my head. Yep. And then once I can see it, almost like a TV show or a movie, that's when I sit down and I write. And I can write pretty big chunks of the book at one time. And then I step back and I do more days of thinking about it, not thinking about it, taking a step back, and then diving back in again. So I don't really have a, a discipline. I have tried that several times. I have tried to sit down at the same time every day, train that brain muscle. Um, I've used spreadsheets to track my word counts. And all it's led to is some really, really bad starts of books. <laughs> so <laughs> I just sort of embraced how it works because the truth is it does work. This is my ninth book. So I feel like whatever I'm doing, I'm just going to keep doing that until it doesn't work anymore. The reason why I bring that up is because I know inside my heart that someone's going to be reading your books and they too are going to become an author, but they're going to run away from it in the very beginning because they don't understand that we can do exactly what you just talked about. Yes. You know, I, when I do school visits, kids always say, like, well, how did you become a writer? Or what's your day like as a writer? And I really try to impress upon them, if you ask that question of every writer you meet, you're going to get a completely yep. different answer yep. every single time. And there's really no wrong way to do this job. There isn't a playbook. There isn't a guidebook. Whatever works for you to make you a creative person that can still perpetuate that creativity where you don't burn yourself out, where you don't feel like you've worked yourself into a hole or you've overworked yourself. That's the way to do it. And I will obviously offer writing advice if kids ask, but I always, you know, present it with the idea of this is what works for me. It doesn't have to work for you. And I think that is one of the the hardest and the best parts of the job. There isn't a plan but if you're a person who doesn't always work well with a plan, then this could really work for you. Yeah, I always sit down with them and go, go get a writing instrument, call it your own, give it a name, and after you're done writing your story, never use that writing instrument again because it belongs to that book. <laughs> and, and that's the way I do Thank it. Thank you for it your a, friend. And, I, yeah. I do it that way with my Mont Blancs. I mean, my last book, I mean, I have not used that writing instrument ever since. <laughs> I feel like I'm that way with locations. Like yeah. I wrote a book far from the tree in the coffee house. And after I finished the book, I never went back to that coffee house. I just couldn't do it. I felt like I had done it already. And then I wrote this book in my home office, and which is a problem because I need to now find somewhere else yep. that isn't in my house. So. Yep. Yeah. Cause it's too easy to walk away. It is. It's, Oh, the, oh, the dog needs to go out. Yep. Oh, there's a, there's a spoon in the sink. I can't work with this kind of conditions, you know, and <laughs> the next thing you know, you're organizing the spice drawer and you know, nothing gets done. So how did you get a softball team involved in this storyline? When did that hit you? Was it in the middle of the night? No, I really wanted to write about this idea of girls coming together under the gut, not under the guise, they just have this sort of disorganized softball team, but it's a way to keep them coming back together again and again outside of school. And 
a lot of it was based on the idea of my mom when she was growing up in the 50s she was extremely athletic she loved to play sports and she couldn't because at that time in the 1950s girls weren't allowed to play sports there wasn't soccer teams there wasn't volleyball for you know it didn't exist like that and so she wasn't able to play and I always thought like she's had a wonderful life and obviously she's had me so I'm very happy with the way things went but you know you you can't help but think well what other opportunities could have presented themselves scholarships college scholarships you know anything like that the way that they were available to boys at that time and I just wanted to see girls to be honest not only playing and having the ability to play but not realizing how special that is or how rare that could be no not understanding that not everybody had that Wow. The girls of Skylark Lane, that in itself should inspire people to write stories about their own neighborhoods and communities. I would hope so. I think the more, the better. Yeah. Where can people go to find out more about all of your writing? Because I want these middle schoolers and adults to find your writing and give you some love. (laughs) So the book comes out this week. You can find it at your local independent bookstore. Always a big fan of my local indies. Uh, You can also find it online wherever books are sold. Have you? I'm I'm probably going over the time limit here, but I love going into those independent bookstores just to people watch. It is the greatest experience because they're discovering things. They, it's new they to are. them. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah, it. My, my local bookstore has a huge staff picks wall, and I'm always going in to read, like, what is the staff reading? Because <laughs> I know it's going to be good. <laughs> you got to come back to this show anytime in the future, Robin. The door is always going to be open for you. Oh, thank you very, very much. This has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? I will do my best. <laughs> I make no promises, but I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day.